Welcome to To The Point. Hope you die. Hope your family dies. Hope everybody your staff dies. That was part of an expletive-laced phone call, one of dozens Congressman Fred Upton received after voting for a bipartisan infrastructure bill. I talked with him about that experience and the larger issue of partisanship in Washington. Let's start with a vote that you cast in favor of an infrastructure bill supported by the president and many Democrats. I think there were 13 Republicans that voted for it. And the fallout from that. First, we're going to talk about the politics. Then we're going to talk about the policy. Uh, you voted for the bill along with some of your colleagues and one of your other uh, members put out telephone numbers, which, by the way, it's not hard to find telephone numbers for congressional offices. And you started getting a bunch of telephone calls. Can you describe that for me a little bit and what the pushback has been? Well, a couple of things. First of all, as a member of the Problem Solvers Caucus, bipartisan group, you, you've covered this story for months. We met with Governor Hogan last April to define what is infrastructure, how do we pay for it, don't want to add to the debt, don't want to raise taxes. This was the very blueprint that we helped write that the Senate passed 69 to 30. It was held hostage by the Progressive Caucus. They, they wanted to put it together. Uh, we cut the, cut the tie on that uh, with a Build Back Better plan that still hasn't been decided yet. But because of my colleague, uh, MTG as we call her, she put out our names and phone numbers and literally we got a thousand calls uh, earlier this week. Uh, some of them pretty nasty. Uh, some of the police will, law enforcement is probably going to be knocking on some doors uh, there because they just simply didn't want Biden to get a win. I think that was the bottom line. Uh, and you'll recall that President Trump had an infrastructure bill too. His was actually more expensive, almost twice as much with no pay for it. was just going to add to the debt. That's not what this bill did, which was why even Lindsey Graham, Trump's very best friend in the Senate, uh, supported the bill when it passed 69 to 30 last August. One of the calls that was on a major network uh, and has been played elsewhere, and I, and I won't use all of the expletives. And then, they won't <clears throat> let you. The FCC <laughs> won't let you. But, but it was, uh, as a reporter, I don't like to categorize things, but uh, as a human being, I can only uh, consider this a vile phone call that wished for you your family and staff to die. Yeah. Uh, that is about as cruel as it comes when it comes down to a single vote. What impact does that have on you, a longtime member of the House of Representatives with uh, a long knowledge and respect for the institution. What it, what does that do? You know, it's really tragic. It's really a, a and it sends a terrible signal. You know, we see violence, and of course, we're seeing that across the country. This idea that you can go after public figures uh, in a very vile way, threatening you know their staffs. I mean, our our offices may be closed a little bit uh, in, in the next couple of days because of the threat. So we don't know how serious they are, but you know, there was more than one. But it just adds to that fever of violence that, frankly, we don't want our kids to see and we don't want our, our friends and neighbors to see. Uh, and, you know, it's disagree on the issues, but don't be disagreeable. This is more than that. This is real uh, hard knock stuff. And I just hope that it doesn't lead to some true act of violence uh, that, that takes somebody out or causes some serious injury. I mean, we really dis awful. I want to get to the policy. I don't want to belabor this uh, too long, uh, but I was talking to a group of people in South Haven recently, and one of the questions that was asked afterwards, after I had suggested Washington was more polarized than I had ever seen it, uh, and somebody asked, well, why do you believe that? Can you give me an example? And the example I used then um, was about the debt ceiling, um, and that's always been a bipartisan vote. Republicans and Democrats as president and members of Congress contribute to that debt. And at least from a practical standpoint, you have to pay your bills. And I was using that as kind of why this is. But now we come to this vote, this vote on an infrastructure bill where Democrats needed all of their votes and they didn't get them. 
without Republican votes in this case, presumably, this might not have passed. Well, it, it still would have, because remember right. the vote was 228 to 206. Okay. So there were 13 Republicans that vote. They were always going to vote for it. I mean, we were not undecided, all right? We worked on this plan for months. It was fiscally secure. It addressed infrastructure needs that we needed to do. So it wasn't like, oh, I'm going to listen to the debate and figure out how I'm going to vote. So if you take those 13 votes away, uh, as long as they don't go to no, it still passes because of the margin that was there. And you got to remember, too, that the progressives, the AOCs, I mean, Tlaib from Michigan, they still voted no. So it was, um, you know, our, our, you know, so you take the, if you, anyway, it's, well, it, it, I, but, but at the end of the day, too, remember the vote three months ago in the Senate was 69 to 30. My, my point, I guess, is, is it so unusual now in Washington that this small group of Republicans would go along with this plan supported by a Democratic president that that's just out of the norm? And, and that's why we get this kind of reaction, because there was a time when most bills in Washington were bipartisan. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, you're right. I've never seen a more toxic time this vote pretty illustrative of it. You know, bipartisan vote in the Senate, significant number of House Republicans actually voted, helped write the bill. Uh, they were tugged leadership, you know, the, you know, Biden got a big loss uh, in Virginia and, you know, pretty close in, in New Jersey, almost lost that seat. People are thinking ahead to 22 and 24, but, you know, we're there to govern. I mean, you know, one of my Democratic colleagues uh, uh, actually said, you know, we wanted this president to end the chaos. Uh, uh, and, you know, that, that hasn't really happened. But we got a lot of things to do. I mean, not only the balance of this year, we got some big fiscal cliffs coming. The continuing resolution expires. We have another debt ceiling uh, debate that's going to be up the, the first week of December. Uh, a lot, you know, traditional end of year, you know, tax extenders, all those. So it's it's pretty difficult. And when you see the, the violent, you know, phone message and everything else, um, it's pretty rugged life right now. Let's talk about the policy. What did you vote for? What is in this infrastructure bill that made you and some of your colleagues say, this is the right move? So remember going back to spring. President Biden came up with this massive spending plan, three and a half trillion dollars. Some would say it included everything and plus the kitchen sink, everything else. Uh, laundry list of programs. Was funded with major changes to the tax cuts that uh, President Trump was able to get through that I supported that really, I think a lot of people give credit before the pandemic to really move in the, the country forward. Uh, lots of different ways, not only on the the corporate side, but on the, the personal side as well. Governor Larry Hogan, Maryland, Republican governor, uh, convened a meeting in late April, it's actually on my birthday, <laughs> where he invited a number of other governors, both parties, senators, both parties, about 20 uh, House members, both parties. And we sat down over a long table and we had uh, Pundits come in like Larry Summers for, you know, real economic czar, what you ought to be able to do. We defined what is it, what's infrastructure? What is it? What should be on the table? What shouldn't be on the table? New revelation to a degree is broadband. We certainly saw that with the pandemic. I mean, if you don't have broadband, man, you are lost. I mean, whether it's telemedicine, whether it's simply getting a motel or airline or dinner reservation, you, you need to have that. We talked about replacing lead water lines, uh, an issue that, you know, certainly we know here in Michigan, but it's all, all over the country. We talked about PFAS, something that no one frankly heard about until a couple years ago. It's a forever chemical that really does cause serious birth defects, a whole number of bad things. Talked about our ports, and of course we have this supply issue out on the West Coast with some hundred ships. We don't have the, the port strength, the truck drivers. I mean, all those different needs. And we put that together as one bill. Here's what infrastructure ought to be. No, it's not long-term health care, important issue, but that's not really infrastructure. It's not expanding Medicare, a whole number of different things, important issues, but not traditional infrastructure needs. And then we came to the debate of how do we pay for it? 
Now, in the COVID packages, whether it be under President Trump or under President Biden, lots of money, trillions of dollars added to the debt. No pay fors both presidents. And we needed to get through that to survive as a country. The plans for small businesses with PPP, Paycheck Protection, I mean, all those different things keep, keep people employed. But we said, we're not going to add to the debt on this. No, we're going to actually have pay fors And we did. We recaptured money that was going to states, uh, the unemployment benefits that, that wasn't used. Uh, we retargeted that towards infrastructure. We did a whole number of different things without raising taxes, and we made it pretty much equal. And that was the end. You know, at the, it was controversial even in the Senate when they passed it, 69 to 30, pretty overwhelming. But people wanted to add more. And the, and the deal was, no, that breaks really the bipartisan plan that we helped write in the kitchen of the governor's mansion uh, in Maryland. So it passed. And, you know, I was one that asked, we had plenty of press conferences outside the Capitol. We asked not only Speaker Pelosi, but also the president, call us back. We're on August break. Call us back so that the House can vote on this and get it done. There are real infrastructure needs. You don't have to look very far here in Michigan. Remember Governor Whitmer's challenge, you know, pledge, fix the damn roads. That's what this bill does. Now, it waited. Uh, it waited because President Trump, frankly, was one. He opposed it because he said, I got a better deal. Uh, I want to do two trillion, not 1.2. But of course, his plan didn't have any pay for us. And that was it. He said, wait till 24. Wait till I'm president again. In essence, I'm paraphrasing here. But, um, you know, let, let's wait till then. We didn't. Uh, but the White House, they really did try to couple these two bills together, the three and a half Build Back Better plan, the BBB plan, with this one. Uh, and this bill, the BIF, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill, sorry to talk about these acronyms, was coupled for some time then, held hostage, I'll use those words, by the progressives to say, we're not going to let that one pass unless we get this larger plan done. Well, guess what? Our Problem Solvers Caucus actually broke the cord. Uh, and we were able to have a separate vote. I don't know what the outcome ultimately will be of the BBB. It started at three and a half trillion. Senator Manchin got it down to 1.8. Uh, member Bernie Sanders was saying 3.5 is the floor, not the ceiling. So Manchin's got it down to 1.8, but it's got a lot of baggage. And when Congress returns the week of the 15th of November, we'll see what happens. Uh, it may, you know, it's going to, it has a very still uncertain fate. I'm not for it, the bill. Uh, it, we'll see what the ultimate bill is that Pelosi tries to pass in the House. It's going to change still in the Senate because the Manchin and Cinema they've already announced their opposition to some big planks of that. So who knows what happens as we get to the close of this calendar year. Very uncertain. One of the questions that I have is that as the more moderate group of Democrats were able to, along with the problem solvers, help to separate these two bills, much to the dismay of the more progressive group, those progressives didn't vote in favor uh, of the infrastructure bill. Is it likely, and maybe this is just a guess, is it likely that when the Build Back Better plan comes through, and my view is that fewer Republicans will vote. There'll be no Republican that will vote for the BBB. Plan. Then do those moderate Democrats, as did the progressive Democrats, sit on their hands when that vote comes up and make it impossible? To well, vote? that's what we're waiting for. So one of the things that the moderate Democrats were able to get was a Congressional Budget Office score of the BBB plan. Uh, we don't know what it is as we talk today. We don't know what that score is going to be. I think they're going to have a real, because remember, the pres President Biden said it was going to be paid for. It was paid for first by really undoing a lot of the Trump tax cuts. Then it was paid for by a wealth tax that, that it never was vetted. I mean, it was sort of a crazy scheme that a couple people came up with. Now that's been jettisoned. So I don't know exactly what their pay fors are going to be. But they're going to be held to task, particularly by us Republicans, when that bill comes up by saying, you said it was paid for, but I find it very difficult that they're going to be able to pay for it, particularly at a level of nearly $2 trillion in terms of what they're going to do and 
the games that they might play. Remember, this was initially a five or 10 year bill. So they just simply reduced the years that you'd have these government expansion plans, knowing full well that once you provide these benefits, it's pretty hard to take them away again. So that's why even the Wall Street Journal announced in a week or two ago in some editorials, it's, it's not really 1.8 trillion, it's really about $4 trillion uh, if you take it out for the normal 10-year budget plan, uh, spending plan that is often cited. More of our conversation with Congressman Fred Upton next, To The Point. Welcome back to To The Point. We continue our conversation with Congressman Fred Upton talking about the current water crisis in his district in Benton Harbor. I'm going to shift gears a little bit, although it's much of what we've been talking about. This week you were in Benton Harbor, and uh, we have seen, obviously with Flint, now with Benton Harbor, the serious infrastructure problems that we have. And as you pointed out, it's not Michigan, it's around the country. Um, it's not just the stuff above the surface, the roads and bridges, all of which need work, but it's the underground stuff that you don't see. Uh, tell me about your observations in Benton Harbor. You were there, you actually brought the head of the EPA uh, to Benton Harbor. That's right, a year ago, uh, more than a year ago, I brought uh, the administrator of the EPA uh, to Benton Harbor. He actually presented a check for $5.6 million to, to the city to begin to replace lead service lines uh, to homes uh, in Benton Harbor. They've exceeded the threshold. They knew that this was a major step forward, something that, you know, particularly after Flint and what we know about that, uh, we need to identify businesses and homes, but th these lines, let's face it, need to get replaced. Uh, and frankly, the administration, and this goes back to Obama, Obama, Trump, and now Biden, they need to reform or give us really what the safe count is for the lead and copper rule uh, for, for safe drinking. They've been studying this now for years and still haven't come up with promulgated the regulation that we want to see happen. But bottom line is, we knew in Benton Harbor uh, that they exceeded the limit. Uh, they needed help. That's why I came to, to the scene last year. The good news is the work is finally starting. Now, yes, uh, earlier this week, I saw the first home, the lead service line being replaced. Literally, they, they pulled it through, took out the lead line, pulled in a new copper line uh, in that same conduit. Uh, and the money that I got will replace uh, the lead service lines for some 880 homes that they think will be done before uh, a year is out. The governor has made a pledge. She's been down there to replace all of them within 18 months. It's a good goal. I hope that we can do it. But, you know, whether it's Benton Harbor or Grand Rapids or, you know, name the community, uh, it's important that we identify when those lead levels are too high and really do something about it, which is one of the reasons why this infrastructure bill was so important to pass, because it, in fact, will add $15 billion to the funds that are already there to make sure that people are gonna be drinking safe water versus contaminated with lead. When you look at something like Benton Harbor, knowing that uh, the alarm bells were kind of going off for a while because you knew the levels were too high. Um, and here we are now a year past that time. And I appreciate that you have to get bids and you have to, to do all of those things. Do you think that the, the money in the new infrastructure bill might in some way also be used to help cut some red tape and move more quickly to a remedy? I sure hope so. I, I mean, there's a need there, let's face it. I mean, and you know, I mean, you look at roads, you look at bridges, you look at ports, uh, you talk about the needs that are there. Um, this, is, this is a real need and it is frankly, the health and safety of lots of people. So, you know, we're better than this, uh, you know, you know, one of the reasons about the BIF, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill, was China has spent more money on infrastructure with cement in the last three years than we have spent in a hundred. We're behind. Uh, you travel our roads, uh, you see the crumbling bridges. Uh, I think everybody realizes, you know, there, there's a cost here. There's a cost for us for tires and axles and, and everything else. Uh, but we want these things to, to, to work. Uh, you know, we got an air traffic system that's, you know, it's, it's full, our airports. Thank God we have a great airport here in Grand Rapids and real improvements in Kalamazoo and all that. But we want to make sure that we're at the top of the heap, not at the bottom. I want to finish where we began. 
you as and a young I, man I, I remember worked, worked for in the time that I was Stop. there, and you were there certainly before I was. And uh, I yes, was not was quite a young man, also worked on Capitol Hill. I still am young. <laughs> And I, I, I remember they to in the time other, that I was there, and you were there certainly other, before I, um, that, yes, there was issues, partisanship, despite the fact but there was also you know, publicly and, and a friendship know, between members that out front they, they talk to they each other, or they go to lunch with each were, other, or they meet with each other and, and talk about specific issues, I'm not despite the fact that, are. you know, maybe publicly and, and no, you know, more... It, it's really tragic. Out front, they, um, they had to have some opposition. I but there were, it there were I places it, of a It is it's worse than I've ever seen it. I'm you know, not there anymore. Stafford, you are. Is that still happening? No, and there's, it, it's really tragic. Right? Right? I, um, I blame part of it on COVID. I, mean, I think it's, it is, it's worse than I've ever seen it. You know, I was a staffer, worked at the White House. I learned a lot of lessons from President Reagan, you know, Republican president, Democratic Congress. He got a lot of stuff done. That's always been the model that I've had. And Ken Duberstein, his chief of staff, my mentor, uh, probably a lot of things. But the um, but I've never seen, and, and I, you know, I talked to Ken again this week. He's never seen anything like this uh, Part of it is COVID, I think. For two years now, we've been operating, I, I call it Hollywood Squares. We're on Zoom, so when you have a committee markup, you got 50, for me, 56 members that are all postage stamp size, and people forgetting to mute and unmute themselves, you sort of know all about this stuff, and you're not all in the committee room, so you can't go to the lower dais. I'm on the upper dais, so you can't go to any of the dais, and you know, sort of grab someone and say, how about working on this amendment on the Great Lakes, or what it is. And even voting on the so House floor, you know, separated for a good long time, you had to vote by alphabet. In fact, I cheated. I, went, I voted with the A's and B's instead of waiting to the X, Y's, and Z's uh, at the end. We have a Zeldin. So you don't have those personal relationships that you had before. And you know, frankly, Kim, I mean, that's one of the reasons we're the problem solvers caucus. Uh, we're all pretty close. We all made a commitment on civility. We all made a commitment that we wouldn't run against each other uh, in terms of political campaigns. So you build a trust and a bond, pretty much like we had in, in Michigan, too, where it was sort of an unwritten rule that you wouldn't you know, compete for open seats, but, you know, you, you don't run against each other. And, and, help each other, that's sort of an unwritten rule ago, that's been you know, violated just a little bit in Democrats recent times. But you really have that trust and bond, you knew each other's families, and you worked together on behalf of the, the country. I can, uh, somebody said a long time ago, you know, we got too many Republicans and too many Democrats and not enough U.S. congressmen as before and women. I add that, but I wasn't part of the quote. But, it's true today, and it's really sad. It, it really is sad. And, you know, we got we got divided government. I mean, Pelosi's got a three-vote margin. She can lose three, not four. You know, in the Senate, it's 50-50. You got the filibuster rule, so there's a lot of people that just like yeah. to each other out. And it's, uh, tragic. It's not why I came to Congress. It was to get things done. We'll be back with a final thought next. To the point. The atmosphere in Washington seems to continue to be difficult at best and with a number of important issues that have to be dealt with. The congressman alluded to two, the debt ceiling and a continuing resolution for spending. Those have to be dealt with next month. The contentious situation in our nation's capital is not likely to settle anytime soon. We'll continue to follow that and much more each week right here to the point.